نحمد ونسلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد أنا عبد الله بن عمر رضي الله عنهما قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم المسلم من سلم المسلمون من لساني ويده والمهاجر من هاجر ما نهى الله عنه وعن أنا رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إلي أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس يجمعين وعن أيضا قال ثلاث من كن فيه وجد ثلاث من كن فيه وجد بهن حلاوة الإيمان من كان الله ورسوله أحب إليه مما سواه ومن أحب عبدا لا يحب إلا لله ومن يكره أن يعود في الكفر بعد أن أنقض الله منه كما يكره أن يلقي في النار متفق عليه <coughs> My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Henceforth inshallah we will have the dars from Mishkat on different ahadith <coughs> connected with each other and we will touch on issues that are connected to the hadith or related to them. In the first, in the first hadith, Abdullah ibn Umar anhu says, that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa stated, a Muslim <coughs> is he who other Muslims are safe from his hands and his tongue and a muhajir in the modern sense is a person who sort of migrates or avoids sin <clears throat> this hadith basically most of us might know about it but we might not have pondered over exactly why the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi talked about this and why in almost all the kitabs of a hadith it comes under Kitabul Iman. We have basically discussed before this the difference between Iman and Islam. Iman and Islam sometimes are complementary to each other Sometimes some ulama have different views of what is Islam and what is Iman. Because remember in the Quran, when the dwellers of the rural areas came in and said, We have believed. But other aima say that. Iman and Islam are complementary. And you cannot have Iman if you don't have Islam. And if you have Islam, then definitely you have Iman. And as Imam Shafi alayhi, and the other Aimma say, Al Iman wa Yazid wa Yanqas. And the other ulama say, no, it is the Amal which depict the Iman which grow or decrease. Today we have lost that passion of going deep into knowledge and discussing issues. The Ashab Kufa and Basra used to sit for months discussing just one ayah or one Qanun of Nahwi. But today we just look or seek the simplest form of deen and the tarbiyah of our awlad, our children we have left it in the hands of people we don't even know their CVs someone introduces them to us and says this is a ma'alim and we blindly trust our children in the hands of this person 
Yet when it comes to school, we always look to the best schools. We don't matter or don't mind how much fees is being charged. Why? Because we feel that if our children become a certain profession, they will earn a livelihood. But with Deen, because we cannot see the effects, we have been blind, blinded by dunya. Or we can't see the immediate effects. So we didn't take so much precaution. We send our children to any makatib around or any ma'alim around and we don't know what they are learning there. I have done personally a research going around. Even those teaching Duxi today, even those teaching Duxi today, which was a very great achievement because I've been in the northeastern areas and I've seen how they teach Duxi. Unlike here, the people who teach Duxi, if you ask that child to read the Quran inside, he doesn't know. Yet he's memorized, he's a Hafiz of Quran. He knows the surahs, he knows the ayahs, but in the Quran inside, he doesn't know. The talaffud is not correct. He reads majhul. Why? Because the qari or the sheikh who is teaching duksi is more interested in making money than in concentrating on that child. Duksi is supposed to be from Fajr to Isha. So how do you expect someone who comes after Asr tired from school and then you still expect him to read the Quran properly. <clears throat> the reason why I'm going into that is because when it comes to Iman and when it comes to discussions of the knowledge, we know nothing. <clears throat> Our ulama, even on the YouTube, when they're discussing issues, if they ask the spectators or the viewers about any ayah, they'll just give you maybe the literal meaning. So we have to understand what is Islam and what is Iman. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallam sometimes has used Islam and sometimes has used Iman. Yes, that one incident of whereby they said, that was just one incident. But here the Prophet talks about Muslims. And what exactly is Islam? And it comes this hadith under Kitabul Iman. So he said, a Muslim is someone who takes care that he does not hurt others with his hands or his tongue. Now hands here comes by means of actions and the tongue stands for speech. Today the media is the largest propaganda house. Today, the World War III is through the media. A lot of events, when you go down on reality, you find that's not there. You have been told there's a war next door. When you go there, you find people moving around very peacefully. <clears throat> I remember, I had just graduated. In fact, I was in my last final years and the 9-11 occurred. And since my childhood, I've been dressing this way, since my teenage. My own father called me and told me, please, when you're coming, change your dress. And I said, no. Because my sheikh had told me one thing. A coward dies every day, a brave mind dies once. I had nothing to hide, so why should I be afraid? I came in. Two weeks after my arrival, I had a program on Iqra, and the first topic I picked up, terrorism. Even the presenters were shaky. I said, no, I'm going to address it. Why? Because the media I knew was demonizing Muslims. Jihad is part and parcel of Islam, no doubt. <clears throat> But the West had found a weakness and they were exploiting it 
playing with the emotions of the youth. I would also advise my viewers and others to go and watch this Kenyan movie series Watatu, which was launched by the Belgian embassy, and the French embassy, sorry. You'll be amazed to see the way they sort of excited the emotions and played with the emotions of the youth. So, speech, wording, is very important in this era. We have to be very careful on what to say. What we call, we should be very diplomatic. When I came on that topic of terrorism, I spoke my heart out because I was a youngster at that time. <clears throat> but it sort of had an effect. And I started, as I started integrating into the society here, then Alhamdulillah, I came up with an idea that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had hosted 60 Christians. 45 of them bishops and 50, uh, 15 technical team in Masjid in Nabawi for three days and allowed them to worship inside the Masjid on Sunday to hold Mass. This got my attention and after approaching my various sheikhs, we managed to host Christians at Jamia 18 September 2015 for the first time in the Kenyan history. I had seen us interacting with Christians, but no one had taken this initiative of inviting them to the masjid. My main idea of bringing the Christians into the masjid was not fame and name, was to get them to learn the reality. If you go back from that day, 2018, uh, 2015, you'll find that the cases of persecution went down. My Muslim brothers were being hurt. They used to pick up any youth, and after that you don't hear about him. Extrajudicial killings. But after 2015, the trend changed, said that they started prosecuting, not persecuting. So the media is a very big warmonger. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, he talks about Milisanihi. He knew what he was saying. This tongue has no bone, but it can do more damage than even your fists. So the hadith here says that a Muslim should watch his actions and his speech. And this is not only for the ulama, or the politicians, it's for everyone. Ask yourself today, when you woke up in the morning, how many people did you injure with your actions and your speech? And how many are there just during the course of the day that you made happy because of your actions or your speech? If you take your account on a day-to-day -day basis. Slowly by slowly, you will find that if you watch your actions and your speech, you'll find those surrounding you will be more happy with you. And this starts with family, not outside the house. The way you treat your spouse, the children are watching. When you find your children have got anger issues or they abuse each other. Ask yourself, where are they learning? They are maybe learning from your actions. They might be watching you and how you treat your spouse. Doesn't matter who is treating the other one, but they'll be learning. The girls and the boys. So watch your speech and your actions with your spouse, first and foremost. Secondly, what you say is what you should do. <clears throat> you should not be telling your children, smoking is harmful, and there you are with your ashtray and your cigarette. 
they will not listen. They will start hidingly and when they grow up and they are your age, they will do it openly. So, the first Muslim is in your house. The way you treat your employees, especially your maids, has a great effect on the children if you don't realize. When we did our research during the asons in secondary schools, a lot of people were, oh, they are taking drugs, they're teenagers. No, we were teenagers also. We didn't take drugs and drugs were there during our time. We found a new trend. The new trend is that because of these women equal rights, women have gone out to earn a living, to make a career. Whom have they left at home? The maid. The maid is with the child because maternity leave is only three months. We are pushing for it to be six months, but still it will not be as effective. But three months, the child hardly knows the mother and then is handed over to the maid. By the time he is six, seven years old, he has to go to school. During these four or five years of his life, all day long he is with the maid. Most of them are not literate or educated, or they might be educated, but because of frustrations and because of having no job, they do not look at this job as something very nice. So this child, when he goes to school, during childhood he does not say anything. But as he grows into a teenager, he has in mind that that maid had no authority over him. The only authority he respects is his parents. So when that teacher tries to push him, he looks out and, like, what are you telling me? You are just like my mboch. You are being paid by my parents. You are my servant. Why should you be moving me around? So that is how their mind starts playing games. That is one of the reasons. There are other reasons also. And that is how now they start rebelling. Why? Because the teacher, they feel, has no authority over them. Why? Because they are being paid by the parents. To them, anyone being paid by the parents should be following their instructions, not vice versa. So when we bring in, we brought in careers and gender equality, we did not prepare our generation for it. We did not prepare the men on how to treat career women. We did not prepare the women on how to behave with their husbands. Very few women will respect their husband if they are earning more than the husband, very few. Very few women will answer to the husband if they have a better profession than the husband. Your wife is a lawyer. You are a court clerk. What are the chances that she will listen to you? A lot of my lady friends who are prosecutors because working in the court, we meet them. They've been asking me, Sheikh, how is it that I don't get good proposals? And I laughed and I told him, I told her, who will marry a prosecutor? Because the lawyer doesn't want to marry the prosecutor. It will be conflict of interest. In the court, it will be conflict of interest. The judge might say, both of you are spouses, you cannot prosecute this case. Then who marries that prosecutor? A magistrate will not marry a prosecutor also. They're in the same field. She'll, marry, she'll not marry a doctor. And if she marries a doctor, the doctor will be always fearful that she might prosecute him. So we did not prepare our generation for it. Today, the media, a lot of games are being released. The other day, my children were telling me, there's a new cartoon of some bears and whatever, and their friends. And each character in that cartoon has got a deficiency. Eating disorder, mental disorder, tolerance disorder, and so forth. 
each character in that cartoon has got a disorder or a deficiency. What is it telling the child? And where are the Muslims? Why, who told you that it is haram to make cartoons? Yes, it is haram to make idols of worship or things that will bring reverence in the heart of the child. But who said that if you make cartoons, it will have facial features? And sometimes to get the message across, it is easier through storytelling and cartoons. You are not doing it. You think the non-Muslims are sleeping? No. They are poisoning their minds. They are poisoning their minds. Cinderella is running away midnight. What is that teaching your child? She's going to a Dani ballet up to midnight. The sleeping beauty is with non mahram dwarfs. What is that teaching your child? Popeye is all the time hitting people. What is that teaching your child? There is no cartoon that is imbibing virtues in the child. They are bringing out the vices. And to add to all that, they have got the war games. And last but not least, they have got PUBG. I even said it last time, PUBG is haram. PUBG, there is a version you attack the Kaaba. It is there. You are attacking the Kaaba. And when your power is reduced, you go to the idol and get the power. The idols around increase your power. What is it teaching your child? Shirk. And now that I've talked about the Kaaba, there's a new kofia that has come around which has got a Kaaba here and the Medina here. And people are wearing it very nicely and going to sajda with that. If you look closely, the Orthodox Jews have a symbol of a Kaaba made and put here. And they always walk around with it, especially during worship. You people are not doing your research. And sad to say, your ulamas have just confined themselves to spirituality. Swala, zakah, saum, hajj. Very few alims are thinking out of the box. Sometimes my friend tells me, you're telling us stories. Not stories. I am trying to relate to the hadith what is happening here. I am relating to the real world. That the media has become a power tool. Being misused. And the social media is worse. The ulamas were coming up with photos. TikTok is haram. Instagram is haram. Do you think that the teenagers listen? They will not listen. Instead of saying it is haram and this and that, give them an alternative. You cannot tell me, Sheikh, driving the car is haram and you have not given me an alternative. I work with the environmental change. We are talking about fossil fuels and plastics. But we are giving people an alternative. We are giving you an electric car instead of fossil fuels. With a plastic bottle, we are telling you to use the recyclable bottles or the glass bottles or the refillable bottles. We give you an alternative before taking away what you have. But we are not doing that. We are crying Muslims. Youth are unemployed. MashaAllah, we have got money to invest. There was a time I was at an university and some lady students approached and told me, Sheikh, this is an idea we have. What do we do with it? Yes, what is your idea? We are thinking of making dolls and selling. I said, very good. And they looked at me at like, but uh, Sheikh, you say dolls are haram. Aisha radiallahu anha played with a doll. It is there, the hadith. But you know what was the difference between that doll and this doll? It did not have the facial features. A kid has to play with something. So instead of playing with the babi, why don't you form the niqabi or the hijabi? Make your dolls with the hijab. The eyes are seeing, there are no facial features. So you're telling that girl of yours since childhood that you should have a niqab. You should have a hijab.